Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I'm doing so well. How are you today, Tim? I'm doing great, Lance. In this episode today, we talk to our buddy, a colleague, a friend. His name is Josh Hallmark, and he does a fantastic true crime podcast called True Crime Bullshit. It's so great to have someone like Josh in our universe. He, he is the personification of organized when it comes to researching his topics. He especially puts a lot of time into Israel Keys, the notorious serial killer, and he's so easy to talk to, uh, and it makes these conversations really fun to have and also very informative. That's right, and this episode is going to air on both Crawl Space and Missing Maura Murray because we do talk about Israel Keys in connection to Brianna Maitland, which is primarily a Crawl Space series that we aired here. And then Maura Murray, obviously, is a, is a topic that we discuss in depth, Lance, on our podcast, Missing Maura Murray. So our conversation does touch upon Israel Keys being ruled out of either one of those disappearances, but Josh does drop a little bit of a, a nugget that uh, I didn't know about, which was that Israel Keys had access to a small airplane, which kind of opens up some some other doors of opportunities. It really does, Lance, and uh, and we know based on the FBI's website that Israel Keys was actually on a trip when Moore Murray went missing, and his trips, uh, he usually, well, I don't know about usually, but he sometimes would uh, kill people during those trips. He would fly somewhere, rent a car, and then drive somewhere, and uh, I do think it's pretty unlikely still, uh, the connection to Moore Murray, but speaking with Josh, it's um, probably a little more possible than I realized. Okay, everybody, so make sure to check out Josh Hallmark's show. It's called True Crime Bullshit. There are links in the show notes. Thanks a lot. Welcome back to the podcast, Josh Hallmark of True Crime Bullshit. What's going on? Hey guys, not a lot. What's going on with you? You are such a liar. You just said, hey guys, not a lot. <laughs> right before we started recording, you're like, I got to hire somebody because I, I, I am taking on too much and things are getting out of control. Yeah, no, I, I actually just finished um, wasting an hour complaining about how I don't have time to my partner. Uh, and just, yeah, so no, I am a liar. I, a lot too much is going on. <laughs> Well, the last time we interviewed you here on these airwaves, uh, we spoke about a season of True Crime Bullshit, your fantastic podcast that was not about Israel Keys. It was about uh, serial killer Kelly Cochran. And uh, so I guess tell us where we are now in the trajectory of your show. Yeah. So, you know, I Keys, I think, is someone you could spend multiple seasons doing and, and barely scratch the surface on. Uh and I think when I came into it, gosh, three years ago, it, I had al always just anticipated doing one season because I didn't want to be like, episode 246, e Keys ate a granola bar in South Dakota on Monday. Uh, Wait, what are, you, what are you trying to say? <laughs> uh, no, no, nothing. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. We'll just because this this episode is probably going to be called uh, episode two hundred and thirty six. Josh Hallmark talks about Israel <laughs> Keys eating a granola bar. <laughs> um. So I it just uh that was always the thing. Like you know, quit while I'm ahead. But I I realized the more I did it, it there's just uh, an endless mine of material with him. So uh, after the second season, I had a lot of leads, but I wanted to really create um. I guess a more robust season on keys and make sure I had enough material to warrant doing a third season on him. So I took a break so I could investigate him and told the story of Kelly Cochran, which was a soul sucking, uh, exhausting experience. Uh, it, you know, she is wildly interesting and there's some uh, comedic value to that story, but it just sucked the life out of me. Um, so when that was over, I had continued researching keys, found a lot of great information, some really big new revelations, and figured, all right, it's time to return uh, to the key story. That's really interesting because when we had spoken last, you were talking about how um, you were, I guess, preparing for how soul-sucking that experience was going to be. I do want to get into keys a little bit uh, down the line here, but can you um, give us some examples of what you went through as you were researching and producing season two? Yeah, so um, 
the uh, from from the jump it was pretty pretty bad uh, it took i think 6 or 7 months for the foia files to come in um and they were excruciatingly expensive i think all in all it costs like 4 grand to get them uh but because as you know production schedules you can't just call your advertisers and be like hey i don't have the files yet so we're going to have to press pause <laughs> um so i had to start the season without the files which was not how I like to do things. Um, and then once the files came in, it was just so it was such a huge information dump that I was producing while going through just, I think, 10,000 pages of documentation and like 40 hours of interviews. Uh, and the thing with Kelly is, you know, Keyes lies, but he lies to cover things up as to where Kelly lies just for the joy of lying. And so it was harder to understand or even find a utility to her lies uh like with keys when he's lying it usually means something and then you can go into like what is he trying to hide and why is he saying this as to where kelly you're like she's lying just to lie and it just reached a point where i i felt pretty confident that i was not going to make any progress in the investigation and with keys you know we had found all these victims that were very likely his and you know hit the road and found places where he likely buried kill kits and bodies and with kelly it was just like hour 18 and we still had not really found anything out about her except that she lies more often than i anticipated she lied so it just became very exhausting and she is um kind of an asshole like (laughs) and you know all serial killers are assholes but kelly was just it was excruciating listening to her talk and uh you never had any actual uh contact with her on the phone or anything like that no i I'd, I'd written her multiple letters which she never responded to and i'm i keep anticipating i haven't been to my p.o box in like a month and i'm like oh gosh i'm gonna go in there and there's gonna be a bunch of letters and artwork from her <laughs> yeah probably at some point that's uh, that's crazy how deep you get into these things. Um, you had said that you started your season without the FOIA files, and that's something that you don't typically like to do. Um, that must have just made you feel like so off right from the get go. Uh, just because that's not what you do. You know, you want to be prepared as you go into it. If you had received those and and you looked everything over, do you think you would have had second thoughts just in in just overall about the season, or do you think that would have told you anything about her that? That's a great question. I don't think if I had received the files before production started, I would have changed anything uh, just because the story is really interesting. And there's, you know, with Keys, it's it's a very dry investigation, I guess, um, in that it's, for the most part, he's a pretty standard serial killer. And I hate talking about it in these terms, but, you know, narratively speaking, it's just a pretty classic investigation as to where with Kelly we had like weird cannibalism and affairs and her drugging people and it just was a a dynamic story in a very different way from what I was used to so I think even now knowing what I know and knowing how exhausting it was doing that season I would do it all over again I just maybe would be a little more prepared and um and hedge my expectations better Okay, but so now you're in your wheelhouse a little bit more. You feel like you're back in your comfort zone covering keys in season four? Yeah, I do. And uh, again, it goes back to like, is there story to tell? And and halfway through the Kelly season, I was like, I think we're out of story. Uh, and with keys, I'm like, oh, man, we still have so much more story to tell. And that's really invigorating and uh, inspiring. Good. Um, yeah, what, tell us, um, tell us where you're at. What, uh, it's probably a big question, but, uh, yeah, what, what's rolling around in your noggin right now? Well, I think going into the season, we found out some very big information. Also, because of quarantine, I was able to get out on the road, which I've never done before, and drive to a lot of these locations. I live in the Northeast, where his family had a home, he had a home, he did a lot of his criminal activity. So I got to get out on the road and see places and meet some people who are close to the case and close to Keyes. We also found out through some sources that Keyes had access to a private plane, uh, which was like a huge bombshell because here's this guy who travels to kill people and his timeline seemed really limited. And we were trying to figure out, like, how is he in all these places, yet there's no travel records putting him there and finding out he had access to a private plane and was on it 
at least a few times. Uh, we're still trying to dig into the records because, unfortunately, the FAA doesn't require pilots to keep A, manifest, but B, even their flight records for more than three years. So that's been a new task. Was this private plane like a little Cessna that he flew himself or did he have a pilot? His his girlfriend's brother was a pilot and owned multiple planes, and he was tri- taking them around on little trips. By himself? Unclear if Keyes went alone with the brother, but we, we know that Keyes often committed crimes while on vacation with family and friends, so uh, that, that doesn't necessarily like negate criminal activity that he was with Kimberly, but uh, if he was on his own, it definitely opens up the pool of what he was able to do. That's incredible. Have you been able to speak with the brother? I just reached out to him. Um, I was timing my contact with him, so um, he didn't have an, enough of an opportunity to get ahead of things before I ran that episode. <laughs> um, so I've just reached out, and we'll we'll see what he has to say for himself. Wow, could you imagine that? Like, do you think he had any clue? No, no, I don't think anyone had any clue, which is probably why there's been this ongoing question of like why is Kimberly being so secretive who is she trying to protect and it's like oh this is why Uh, she's she's trying to protect her little brother who had no clue but uh you know it's frustrating that they are not sharing things with the FBI but I also get it Uh, this is probably really traumatizing for them wow that's absolutely wild so no record that Keys could even fly plane himself I know I'm harping on the him being alone thing but I'm just curious no. Okay. So he likely didn't take it alone then. Yeah, no. Wow. But but yeah, as you said, that doesn't really matter. That's that's incredible. Do you know where they went in the plane? Well, so the, this particular plane, the plane that he was most frequently flying at this point, um, could only go, I think, 450 miles before it needed to refuel. So obviously he could go anywhere, but, you know, from a practical viewpoint, he's probably only going 450 miles from Sacramento, uh, which is actually three hot spots that Keys was most active in, which is like the Salt Lake area, the Riverside, California area, and the Washington Peninsula. So it's getting him to those places, and it's very reasonable for him to be like, hey, can you take me to Salt Lake City? Here's some cash. I don't want to fly commercial um, because he's a bank robber, so he always has cash on hand, and that way he's avoiding any sort of digital footprint uh, and he's using this stolen cash so there's no transactional records of him doing anything Uh, so it was a really great way for him to evade any any police accountability later on and what what year what what time frame was he probably flying around 2006 until his arrest 2006 until his arrest I know that after 9-11 because I I knew I knew a guy who was like an amateur pilot, and he and he told me after nine eleven it was like a completely different story. Like they 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 pretty much were like, oh, you're you're going up today, okay, sign in, sign out. Uh, after nine eleven, it was a lot more strict, and they they had a lot more regulations that were put in place, obviously. So I wonder if there's any um, paperwork. Oh, what? No, oh, yeah, you already looked into that. You said that they're only required to keep it for three years. Yeah, and, and what I found was is as long as it was domestic, they just needed to write the plane's information, the pilot's information, and number of souls on board. They didn't even need to give a manifest with names. So Really? Yeah, <laughs> which was shocking to me. <laughs> shocking. Could you imagine doing something in your life like uh, you're, you're podcasting, right? And could you imagine you know, your partner's brother saying, oh, I got a full-blown podcast studio for you to use whenever you want. This is a serial killer whose partner's brother says, yeah, I got a plane. Pretty much no record on it. You guys want to go up anytime you want? He was like, sure. Also, just because I've been doing tons of research into true crime is wild, you become, you know, a mini expert in a lot of strange things. But like, I know basically the FBI or the HSA has a file with every flight any of us have ever taken on a commercial airline, but yet there's no accountability on private planes, which is crazy. And, you know, we can go into the, um, I guess, economic uh, discrimination involved in that. (laughs) But uh, yeah, it's really messed up. Yeah, that's a good point. And how did you find out about this? Uh, How did you learn about it? So I have a few sources who um, wish to remain anonymous, but are close to various parts of the story and one of them reached out to me gosh almost a year ago 
and said, oh, um, check out Sacramento. Keys had access to a private plane. And this source had been probably the least consistent um, of the sources I have. Like, whenever I put anything to air, I always make sure I can corroborate it as to a certain extent. And I'd been able to do that with this source, but this source kind of came and went. They were a little bit flaky. And when I saw that, I also was like, I don't know how you would have this information based on your familiarity to things. So I kind of wrote it off because it seemed so implausible. And then a few months ago, a different source who would absolutely know this, who did not know that other person, came forward and said, hey, I think you should have this information. Keys flew multiple times in... Kimberly's brother's private plane. Um, they're based in Sacramento. And so when that person had some of the same details as this other person, I was able to go track down her brother, find out he was a pilot. He did have these two planes. I was able to see where they were flying in and out of um, currently. And I was able to see when he bought them. And so once I was able to corroborate all that, I was good. And then it was sending a fax to this small airport being like have you seen this man which felt strange and a little out of my depth <laughs> um and waiting for hopefully like a receptionist to come back and be like oh yeah that i recognize that guy and then that final step was reaching out to the brother which i have not heard back from him yet so when you reach out to a place like an airport um how do you do that do you write them a letter or do you email i sent an email and then i sent a fax which was a strange thing i have not sent a fax in like 15 years <laughs> Where did you find a fax machine? <laughs> you you can you can install them on your laptop. Like it was like a thirty dollar program, and they basically like will fax a PDF somewhere. Okay, it's a pretty wow. remarkable technology, though. When you think about it, a fax like that's pretty cutting edge. It is. <laughs> <laughs> it, it does feel almost more magical than an email with a picture, but yeah, for mm -hmm. some reason. But, um, Josh, what, your your road trips? Where were you driving around, and who were you driving around with? Well, I was driving around with our good friend Kaz uh, on the first road trip, and it was great to have her because I'm a little bit of a chicken, and I don't, I won't talk to strangers generally, and I won't like go tromping around on property or into the woods. So she was kind of my motivator in some of those senses. But we, oh gosh, we went to Albany, we went to Tupper Lake, we went to. Keene, New York, where we think something may have happened. We went to Constable to his cabin up in the woods. We went to Essex, where the couriers were abducted and eventually murdered. And that was our first trip, and then I've gone on two subsequent trips to some other towns that will come up in the podcast later, and we are planning a main trip and a Pennsyl Pennsylvania trip, so we are getting around. <laughs> wow, that's a, that's a massive trip. Uh, I lived in Keene. New York? Oh, I thought you meant Keene, New Hampshire. No, New York. He never listens to me either, Josh. <laughs> and I, I have to say that Lance's background is just a, a an ongoing um, uh, slideshow of photos with me, and it's making me deeply uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> no, Actually, what, what, what should be making you uncomfortable is this is um, the last time we spoke in, in Worcester. I'm literally wearing the same thing. Oh, I am too. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> I mean, you can't see it because I'm in a dark room, but yes, I'm wearing the exact same clothes. <laughs> well, it feels like we're in Wormtown again. It does. In your travels, I uh, you did you go to Vermont too? Yeah, yeah. So I went to uh, Essex twice, and then I went to a town called Brattleboro, which is actually not far from where I am currently. Uh, and that was a really eye-opening trip, and I don't want to get into too many details because we will deep dive that in the show at some point. But um, that was really weird because <laughs> Google Maps did me dirty and sent me uh, on this back road when I was like, the rule with Kaz and my partner was like, just be off the road by sundown. Uh, and sun was setting i was an hour and a half from home and i was like all right it's time to go home and then google maps like sent me out into the woods on a dirt road and some jerk and i you know i grew up in a small town with country roads and i know people out there are assholes but some jerk like turned on their brights and like got up onto my bumper and was you know trying to intimidate me but we all know that keys used to do that to try to run people off the road and i've 
at that point had spent like 48 hours just really living in the keys world and i was like oh great so now here i am in the woods uh where we believe keys actually did abduct someone and and someone is trying to intimidate me and so i was going like 55 on a dirt road through the woods like winding roads in the middle of the night and it was a little bit terrifying (laughs) oh you sped up yeah instead of like pulled over to let him go yeah wow yeah i should have pulled over to let him go but just that off chance that you know he was a psychopath (laughs) which i don't think he was but that's where my brain was at the moment that's where your brain should be i mean first of all you don't have to put your high beams on somebody that takes that's an aggressive move so if he wasn't a full psychopath he was like 30 to 40 percent there non-violent psychopath and brattleboro is a great little town it is it is i'm, I'm curious to hear your story about brattleboro see that's very close to Keene, new hampshire it, yeah it's probably half hour oh okay. you kind of came pretty close to uh brianna maitland's uh crash site and even maura murray's crash site uh to a degree how likely is it do you believe that keys was in those areas sure. Kaz and I went to Brianna's site, and I went to Maura Murray's, which was a very strange experience. Um, The keys of it all, and I know this is a very controversial opinion, and I would say I'm at 50% either way, um, with keys being involved in Brianna's disappearance. Uh, The thing that struck Kaz and I, and Kaz was a lot more skeptical than I was about his possible involvement, is... Keyes had a cabin in Constable, New York, and his family had a cabin in Smyrna, Maine. And as you know, the road that Brianna disappeared from and her car was found on is not like a highway. You kind of have to know where that road is. The most direct route from Keyes' cabin to his family's cabin goes right past the Black Lantern Inn and the crash site. So we were a little weirded out by that. Um... And then, you know, there are all these variables with Keyes' crimes that come up in that, like an abandoned farmhouse and moving cars and staging cars to look like accidents and potentially running people off the road. Uh, There were sightings of Keyes within a mile of a diner that she worked at a few weeks before she went missing, um, asking people how deep Lake Champlain was in certain points and asking people if... (laughs) Um, anyone would know they disappeared. Uh, you know, just common small talk you make with strangers. Uh, wow. wow, sorry. Let me uh, hold on for a second there. So that was the the other job that Brianna Maitland had. I forget the name of that diner. Yeah, yeah. I oh, I forget it too. But it's in St Albans, like downtown St Albans. Yeah, and I don't think Brianna worked there for long too. It was maybe maybe no more than a month. Yeah. Wow. So while she was working there, there's a sighting um, just down the road from it with keys asking some strange questions and where sorry to interrupt where did you get that information that there was a sighting that close to the diner uh in the fbi files oh okay and then there's this you know that the fbi allegedly have ruled keys out uh which is interesting because it does it's not anywhere in the files in fact her case does not come up at all in the files which means one of two things is it's not in it or they redacted it and I do know the two other cases that have been entirely redacted from the files, the FBI believes he was involved in. So that has always been a little suspicious to me. They've said in interviews that he can be ruled out because of a phone ping that places him elsewhere. Um, But I have all their recorded phone pings and there aren't any on that day. Uh, So the way they talk about it is interesting to me. Um, And I do know there's another case where they said that they had ruled keys out but a month after they made that statement, they had flown to this tiny town and were like doing DNA testing and digging around. So, um, yeah, I make of that what you will. Wow, I, I'm a bit surprised, uh, and uh, because we we had heard they had ruled her out, so we really didn't look at it much uh, at all, to be honest. Um, and and I guess one other reason is because of the amount of shady people around Brianna in her life at that time. There's enough to fill an Agatha Christie murder mystery. Yeah, you know, I think I it's hard because with James Koenig, Samantha Koenig's father, had Keyes not been arrested, uh, they probably would have arrested him. He was their lead suspect. They were filing warrants on him. They thought for sure he was involved because he was a shady character. She also had a bunch of shady characters. So Occam's Razor is like, yeah, it's probably the shady characters in her life, but that that is by no means 
exculpatory uh, for a serial killer. And I just, to me, there's a lot of coincidences. So I don't think that Key should be ruled out um, just because there are other likely suspects. And, you know, the Spear case is another great example, which is also a controversial case. Um, and I, again, I would say I'm 50-50. I wouldn't be surprised if it was him, um, but I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't. And that's how I feel about Brianna. And he was asking people um, during this particular sighting how deep Lake Champlain was? Yeah, so he has this thing that comes up constantly uh, where he will just like bump into a stranger in the woods and be like, hey, how's it going? Would anyone know if you disappeared today? Do you know how deep this lake is? Uh, you know, just... <laughs> he, he asked people that? Yeah, constantly. What, what would you do? What would happen if you disappeared today? Would anyone know if you disappeared today? What? Yeah. <laughs> it's an icebreaker. It's an icebreaker. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's kind of like, welcome to Wormtown. Yeah. <laughs> when I'm going through the uh, drive through at Duncan, I'm like, thanks. By the way, would anyone know if you disappeared today? And people, people are really good natured about it. Yeah. And how deep is Lake Champlain? That's really weird. Okay. What about. Um, Mora's case. So you you mentioned that you went by her uh, crash site. Yeah, I went by just because I was in that neck of the woods, um, and it was very. You know, I've heard a lot about the mythology of how creepy that place is, and I've always a little disregarded it. But I will say, as soon as I got in there, um, it was very unsettling. I got a few phone calls from a local area code, which I know no one who has that area code. Um, I didn't answer them, but I was like, oh, that's weird that like as soon as I'm in Haverhill, all of a sudden, what is it, like 614 starts calling? Six, yeah, 603, I think. Yeah, yeah. something like that. Yeah, so that all New Hampshire 603. Yeah, I just went out of curiosity. I, I, I don't think Keyes is involved. Uh, you know, the rule with the, his timeline is like use it as a foundation but not as a uh, concrete rule uh, the timeline would make it very challenging because he was in Salt Lake City the day before and the day after uh, to me it's just too messy for Keys. you know uh, Keys would not have let a victim talk to somebody else or if they did he would have killed that person as well and um, I, there was so much commotion around her, even though it was just a short period of time that she was out on the bend. Uh, it just, nothing about it feels like keys. He would not have left that car in that state. Uh, so yeah, it just, it never really screamed Israel keys to me. Okay, but he did refer to the Northeast and New Hampshire, I think specifically as his stomping ground. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, what do you know about that? Well, I, I mean, we can place him on that highway as well many times. Uh, he said he was most comfortable killing people in Washington and the Northeast. So there is that. And that's a time when he started to be more active. He was most active in 2010, 2011. But in 2003 to 2005, he had just gotten out of the military. He, according to him, not murdered anyone in three years. So he was really working out his frustrations, I guess. Um, and we just found out that he had a secret girlfriend in Maine who he was going back to visit very frequently, which the timeline does not show. Um, so he was out there and he was driving around and he had multiple kill kits out there. Two, they've been able to recover. He's confessed to several more. It's not out of the realm of possibility. I just, this guy was like a ghost. And I, for, for her to have crashed and then talk to people and be seen by lots of people just doesn't add up to me. Yeah, I hear that. Um, you mentioned the kill kits. Where, do you know where they were buried? Yeah, we know there was one in Winooski River Park in outside of Burlington, Vermont. There was one in Blake Falls Reservoir up in New York uh, outside of Lake, Lake Placid, Saranac Lakes. We have evidence that there was one in Maine, uh, and it, there seem, it seems very likely there was one in my neck of the woods, so kind of like Vermont, Massachusetts, New York area. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was more. Uh, he, he talked about how he had stolen dozens of guns in his life, and every gun that he stole ended up in a kill kit. And they've only recovered, I think, like eight guns. So to me, that means there's a lot more kill kits out in the world. And you said that he had a secret girlfriend in Maine. Do you know where in Maine she was? Yeah, she was outside of Smyrna, which is just outside of, I guess, Nova Scotia. Oh, gotcha. Okay. So this is like super like northeastern Maine? More eastern than north. It's it's about an hour and a half from Bangor. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah, that's that's a haul. That's that's a that's a hike from uh anywhere in New Hampshire. And where was the Kill Kit in Maine? Do you know? Uh, we believe in that area. In oh, the gotcha. Area. That makes sense. But you know, the the Burlington Vermont one is in Keys geography, not far from New Hampshire. So you know that he's in the area. It's a hot spot. He, there's a lot of activity there. We have him on that road multiple times. Is it possible? For sure. Um, I would not be surprised if it was him, but it just the crime scene or the accident scene, however you perceive it, uh, does not look like keys to me. Yeah, that's fair. Um, yeah, and yeah, he was in Manchester, New Hampshire, it seems like here, flying into Manchester in 2004, 2004 October of 2004. Yeah, as far as I know, and I'm, I'm fairly confident I know this accurately, they only found three kill kits. Jeez. So um, nothing about Mora's accident speaks to keys to you but um brianna's is a little bit more uh i guess uh keys centric is there any other unsolved in the area that you might look at and say this needs a, a little bit more investigation regarding keys oh for sure um you know there's there's the case in brattleboro which will come up in the show um there's a two cases in the Amsterdam Johnstown area, Johnstown area of New York. There's a unidentified body that was found in Maine. There, someone found him digging in the woods in rural Pennsylvania. We have the Deborah Feldman case, and the way he talks about her remains leads me and some of the researchers on my team to believe that there are multiple remains buried there so yes and and i want to say like going up to the after the accident a lot of that does look like keys he tried to run people off the road he would stalk people at atms he targeted women driving alone late at night in rural areas so that does scream keys it's just to me it's it's what was left behind afterward doesn't um as to where brianna and i understand there are some comparisons but uh just the distance from which she was last seen to where her car was found the abandoned farmhouse the way the car was parked there that looks like keys and and the fact that they've found evidence but nothing so far i heard recently that they found some dna has been a been linked to anybody that feels like keys not just leaving like a, a chaotic mess uh he was very neat and tidy and clean have you uh talked to anybody from the black lantern uh, maybe people who worked there uh when brianna worked there and asked them if he looked familiar at all not yet but that's it's on my very long list of things i need to do this you need to season. hire an admin <laughs> I do need to hire an admin. <laughs> but uh, I wonder, would that be something Keys would do to go into a restaurant in a small town and, and and scope it out? I don't know that he would go into the restaurant, but you know, his last confirmed victim, Samantha Koenig, we have dozens of reports of him sitting in his car outside of the coffee stand that he abducted her from. And we also know he drank a lot of coffee and he went to the Home Depot across from where she worked almost on a daily basis. So he probably at some point met her or got coffee from her and then staked out that spot. There's reason to believe he was stalking the couriers for some time before he abducted them. Uh, so yeah, there's a precedence for it for sure. Um, and even the Susie Lyle case, which I think he did, um, people saw him staking out parking lots near where she was abducted from. And she also told a friend that someone had been following her so if that was keys that adds up so yeah it would absolutely add up for him to just be lurking around the area trying to see if there was someone abductable or maybe he had his eyes on her and trying to find it the best place to abduct her and uh the murder of the couriers um can you tell us a little bit about that neighborhood you said you visited that house is that is that like a like a wide open area or is that like more of a suburban neighborhood it's a suburban neighborhood, uh, which really struck both of us, um, is we wanted to drive down and look at the house without being, you know, creeps, basically. And we turned onto the street and there were like children playing everywhere and neighbors talking to each other. And you can see into everyone's backyards and 
that struck us as like, oh, this is not just a neighborhood. This is a community. Um, and that felt very brazen, um, especially because we know that he had been in their backyard for hours waiting for the neighbors to go to bed. And you can see their backyard from almost any point on the street. So he's in this community where people know each other and talk to each other. And uh, that felt very uncomfortable. Uh, and then also just the fact that he had said he just went to a random house. He had walked the neighborhood for a long time and was looking for a house with an attached one-car garage with no cars in the driveway, and this was the first one he came upon, and that's just unequivocally false. Um, we we drove the path from his hotel to the courier's home, and there are probably 10 to 15 houses like that before we got to the courier, so we, we believe he was stalking them. He even said at one point, like, well, I knew it was safe to go into their house, and they were like, what do you mean? And he was like, oh, I mean, I just figured it was, so... Why them, then, in your opinion? He had a thing for couples. Um, he also would stake out university parking lots, and they both worked at the nearby university, so perhaps he encountered them at some point there. Um, I think they looked pretty harmless. Um, I, you know, they were older. They both had some health issues. They didn't have a dog. They didn't have kids. They... Um, I think just seemed like really easy targets for him. And because he had this thing with couples and that this was a couple that he could easily overpower, um, I think that just suited his needs. I have a personal question. Did you ever think like 10 years ago that, that you would be getting so deep in the mind of one of the most prolific serial killers in American history? I didn't think that five years ago um, <laughs> I laugh about this all the time because you know 10 years ago I was working in fashion and, and now this is what I do and uh, it's very very strange uh, and it's very strange when people are like as an expert on the keys case and I don't think of myself that way but I guess I am um, because I don't think anyone else has spent more time doing this as an expert in fashion what do you think about my sweater <laughs> well, I'm definitely not an expert in fashion, but, you know, it's it suits you. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I think it looks better on you now than it did a year and a half ago, Lance. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you filled it out better. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, as far as 112, why? H how do you have him on that road? I'm curious about that. We have him at a dance in Deerfield, Massachusetts. We have him in Brattleboro and we have him driving directly from there to the Smyrna cabin. And if you map that out, it goes down that road. We also have him flying into Manchester, driving to Constable. And I believe that one, if you map that out, it has him going that road as well. So there, there are multiple places where he's driving to from where the quickest, most reasonable route would be that road. Interesting. Question about your methods in which you obtain your records. When you get something back from the FBI, do you ever get it back with a note maybe questioning what you're using it for, or do you just get it back as straight files? With the FBI, it's always been straight files, but we, we <laughs> did have an experience recently where... There was a missing persons case out of uh, the border of Pennsylvania and West Virginia, which has already muddied just the filing process. So I can't imagine what the investigation actually looked like. Uh, <laughs> but they responded and said, well, this is a active or it's an open but inactive case. And we are only sharing files with journalists who have a strong lead. And we said, oh, well, we, we do. I'm a journalist. I do have a strong lead. And they were like, can you explain it? And so I wrote out like, oh, this woman's name was on his computer. Everything about her abduction or disappearance matches what we know about his MO. She disappeared from a parking lot late at night on a state line. Her car was never recovered. She was never recovered. Also, did I mention she was on his computer? <laughs> and um, a day after we sent that, they responded to the FOIA request with, due to a new lead in this case, we are no longer sharing files with journalists. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's quite a compliment. 
Uh huh. So yeah, they uh, did us dirty a little bit, and then Michigan would would send us um, more. They didn't seem. It just seemed like curiosity questions, like, "Oh, what are you looking into?" or like, "Oh, do you need these files too for your investigation?" Like, they seemed to be excited to be participating, but I think that was just because it was from such a small town in the Upper Peninsula where they don't see a lot of activity. So what's what's that coming up on uh, this this season? Is there anything? I know you don't want to give out any spoilers, but is there uh, some tea that you can spill here? Yeah, I mean, you know, I I've already spilled some, which is we found out he was having actually multiple affairs with women and men all over the country. Um, so that I think has added a new component to the investigation. Uh, we have found potential evidence um you know obviously i won't call it evidence until we can get dna or fingerprints but we found stuff that resembles stuff keys had in places we know he was um in places we know he generally disposed of weapons um that's coming up uh we've got i think like 10 new missing persons cases that we're gonna deep dive that uh a lot of them i'm very confident are keys and some i think it's worth looking into and then we're going to circle back to i think six or seven cases i covered in the first two seasons where we have new evidence or we have new leads so um, i think it's it's going to be a really great mix of like the standard here's a missing person could keys be responsible as well as like here's new information we have that really contextualizes a lot of what we thought we knew or a lot of the investigations we've already done uh very cool um and also, you mentioned that he had multiple affairs, including affairs with men. Are there any male victims that you are looking at that might be? Yeah. OK. Yeah. In fact, you know, I believe he had more male victims than female victims. And we're going to talk about, you know, there's this mythology about keys that he killed at random and he had no victimology. And it just the more we're learning about him, the more it's just not true. Uh, so we'll talk about victimology and you know, some of the similar traits a lot of his victims had, particularly men of a certain age, uh, which could also just be symptomatic of where he was looking for victims, which was the woods. But they, uh, you know, we've just noticed a lot of patterns in, in the victims that we absolutely can link to him and those that we very confidently believe he was involved in their disappearances. Wow. Excellent work. Yeah. Fantastic work! You, uh, we're we're happy to uh, call you colleagues, Josh. You, uh, you do a great show. Well, thanks. I, you know, and I, I just have to say, it's more about resources. Like, I have all the time in the world, and because I have a strange obsession with this case, like, I've been able to spend, I guess, now seven years, like, looking at every detail. And people ask if I'm frustrated with the FBI or think they did a bad job, and the answer is always no. I just they have limited resources, and once he's dead, like they don't have all the time in the world to look into it anymore. So I think it's just if you spend enough time with a case and really divorcing yourself from it and also divorcing the grisly details from it and just looking at it like in a very analytical way, you will find stuff. So it's less about me and more about just the time I've invested into it. (laughs) 